Okay, Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, this is originally one book on one scroll. It's not until later in church history that we divide them into two little books, Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, I honestly don't know why they did that in the first place. Like that'd be something I could probably spend some time and study on, but it originally was one book, Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, so it's helpful to read them together as one literary unit. But show of thumbs, how did reading go this week? Um, thumbs up, did all the reading. Thumbs down, did none of the reading. Okay. Um, and if you did none of the reading, it's okay because in service, we've actually read at least oh, almost all of Ezra already. And then we will read all of Nehemiah. But it's good about reading the, the scriptures that he's preaching on. Um, what about as far as um, not just comprehension, understanding, but but more of like a, an understanding for why these books are in the Bible. Thumbs up. Oh, I, I know why this book is in the Bible. Thumbs down. Why is this book in the Bible? Uh, this is one of those ones where I'm a thumbs down person, um, at least initially. This one, um, also in the past reading the book of uh, Joshua and Judges, at first they didn't quite make sense to me. It, it seems like um, this is very different than the rest of the Old Testament. At first, it just feels like it's giving me a play-by-play -play of some um, like historical details of things that happened with the return. And maybe that's reason enough for it to be included in, in the Bible. But there were lots of historical records that we know about from the Bible. When we read through Chronicles, the chronicler will reference his sources. And it, he's just like a historian referencing all of his books off of the shelf that he's using. So they had historic records. So if it's just a historic record, why does this one make the cut? and other ones didn't. And it wasn't until um, studying it more and then having very smart people like give me the eyes to see what's going on here that I realized, oh, this isn't just a historical lesson. This is a theological lesson. So once you see the theological things going on in this book, you will not unsee it again. Um, but they're hard to see at first because we're at a point in our, in our Bible and in our Bible reading <laughs> where the biblical authors assume you are tracking. At the beginning, they were very blatant and explicit with how they referenced the Bible itself to where they were actually giving you tools of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a fancy word for the art and science of how to read the Bible. So faithfully interpreting the Bible. And early on in the biblical record, the Bible actually helps you know how to read the Bible. But as you progress through it, it gets less and less explicit to where you get towards the end. And it just assumes that you can be tracking with all these things. The same thing is going to happen when we're in the New Testament. When we get to the book of Revelation, there's going to be like no references whatsoever. And yet the entire book of Revelation is basically comprised of Old Testament quotes. Bet you didn't know that. that is, so the Old Testament is basically just a mixtape of the Old Testament but it's assuming that you, you've learned the skills because you've read the rest of the book and you've been tracking with it from start to finish. So this is gonna be one of those books like that. Um, first, let's talk about the design of the book. So we're gonna do some drawings together. We will add to our timeline in a bit, but first we're gonna draw. Okay, you should have yourself three boxes. Ben, got your boxes? <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me make these a little bit. Okay. Okay, so over here we have Ezra and Nehemiah. This first block is going to be Ezra chapters 1 through 6, then 7 through 10. Then Nehemiah 1 through 
Seven. It's all popular. And then we're going to have eight through 12A, and then 12B through 13. This is the, the simple structure of, of this book. And <clears throat> Ezra Nehemiah is, is following the return and the rebuild of Jerusalem. And we're going to look at the very beginning of the book. It gives you like the little key of what the book is about. It's about the return and the rebuild. And it happens in three waves with three different leaders. What else happened in three waves? Exile. Babylonian exile happens in three waves. And now the return, at least the way it's presented in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, the return happens in three waves. So just like the Israelites were exiled from the land of Judah in three waves, so they return in three waves. It's a picture, it's a, like a, a visible physical picture of restoration. Ezra uh, verses, chapters 1 through 6 is going to follow Zerubbabel. Um, his name means a seed or planted in Babylon. Zerub, Babel, Babel. So he's, he was born in Babylon and he's someone from the line of David. And remember, the line of David is very important in this story. So Zerubbabel, he returns. And what is Zerubbabel in chapters 1 through 6? What is he rebuilding? The temple. Yep. So Zerubbabel comes. He rebuilds the temple foundation, the altar, the temple itself. And some people are, are happy. Some people are crying. They have a little bit of opposition in the story, um, but they overcome the opposition. And then there's this ending where some people are happy, some people are not. The end. That's part of their story. Then chapter 7 through 10 is actually about Ezra. And we're, we're fast forwarding in time quite a bit from Zerubbabel to Ezra. But Ezra is a priest and a scribe. And he comes back and he's also rebuilding something. And the way he does it is he does it through the scriptures. So what he does is he implements Torah. His contribution to the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the people of Israel, is he, he brings back the word of God, word of God and, and helps them observe and obey it. Um, he comes back, they face some opposition, but they overcome the opposition. And then at the end, everyone gets divorced the end. Okay. And then boom, you fast forward again. And there's this guy, Nehemiah, and he's in Susa and he gets a report. Susa is um, ancient Babylon, which is now run by the Medo-Persian empire. And he's a royal cupbearer. He's in the house of the king. And he gets this report from his brother that um, the remnant that's in Israel, they're not doing so hot. I mean, they're having a tough time. They've really faced a lot of opposition. The, the gates are still burned to a crisp. Like, like nothing's really going good for them. And Nehemiah's heart breaks for them. And, and what he does is, is in his sadness, the king's like, Nehemiah, I've never seen you sad before. Oh, what's going on? And he's like, well, my, my city is, is broken where I come from. And the king happens to say, you know what? What do you want? Whatever you want, I'll give it to you. So then what does he go and rebuild? The wall. And in his rebuilding process, they face some opposition from Tobiah and, yeah, Sandballot. Sandballot? Sandballot. I don't know how to say his name. Um, T and S are boys. They give some opposition. They then um, overcome the opposition and the walls are built. And then it's great. It seems awesome. And chapters 8 through 12 are all about how awesome it is. And then you get to chapter 12b, the very end of chapter 12 and 13, and Nehemiah is ripping out people's hair, and it's really sad. That's the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. So what the heck is this book doing in here? Why do we have this book? Great question. Glad you asked. We're going to talk about it. So, yeah. That's a great question. Thank you, Mike. Why is this book in here? This book is contributing to a larger um, narrative arc of the story of redemption. It is a partial fulfillment of the promises of God, 
but it is not the fulfillment of the promises of God. It plays a part, but it is not the thing. And we actually see that um, both in the book itself, but then how the book interacts with the other books around it. Um, I think I have a slide from a long time ago. Yes. Okay. Remember this? Um, the, the way the Hebrew Bible is ordered, they had it all on scrolls, not on individual, uh, not in all in one book, like a codex like we have. There's the Torah, first five books of the Bible, the law. Torah means law or instruction. Then there's the Nevi'im. There's the former prophets, which are Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, and then the latter prophets. So, so those books, they tell the story of the history of Israel from the perspective of the prophets. Then you have the latter prophets. There's the three major, and then there's the minor 12. Um, just like there were three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then 12 tribes. So the prophetic books mirror that. Then you have the Ketuvim, which are the writings. Starts with the Psalms, there's Job, Proverbs. But then there's the Megillot, which is this like strange collection of Ruth, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, Esther. And the last three books, the Hebrew Bible, Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, Chronicles. <coughs> Chronicles is the last book of the Hebrew Bible, um, both from what we can tell from, from historical records of how it was actually organized. It seems to always have been kept as the last book in this conceptual ordering, but then also it's the last book that we know of being written. Um, the book of Chronicles is probably written um, between two and 300 years before Jesus. And one of the reasons we know that is because, uh, you know, all of us, we, we really um, focus when we read those genealogies for those first nine chapters of Chronicles, nine chapters of genealogies. I mean, come on, <laughs> geez Louise. So in those, um, in those genealogies, there are people like Zerubbabel, who we know returns. And then from Zerubbabel, a certain number of generations. And you can, you can guesstimate how many uh, years a generation is, whether you make it 20 years or 40 years. And you realize, oh, the perspective of the author of Chronicles is around three, 200 years before Jesus is born. We also know that the book of Chronicles was formed um, at a certain point, because it's also translated in the Greek Septuagint, which was formed um, in the mid 200s BC. So that's like one, one of the ways we can date this. The, one, the reason why we don't spend time in Chronicles, which is unfortunate, is because in our Bible, what book does it follow? Kings. kings yeah. So we, we read through Samuel and then Kings, and then we get to Chronicles and its genealogies. So we're like, oh my gosh. And we skip forward to chapter 10. And then we start reading about King Saul and we read like two chapters and we're like, I just read all of this. What's going on? So we skip all of it and we jump straight to Ezra and Nehemiah, which is the book that follows Chronicles in our Bible. But why do um, they order them like this? We can actually see a detail. So in our Bible, the, the book right before is, is Chronicles and then Ezra and Nehemiah. <clears throat> uh, the book of Chronicles ends with the Edict of Cyrus. The book of, Chron book of Ezra and Nehemiah begins with the Edict of Cyrus. So just pay attention to, ha to, to how this reads and sounds. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem and let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Edict of Cyrus, the thing that liberates the people from Babylon to let them go back to the land. Here's how it reads at the end of Chronicles, a book written after Ezra and Nehemiah. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Here it is. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. May his God be with him and let him go up. 
to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord. In Chronicles, it ends halfway through a sentence. The book of Chronicles ends with an incomplete sentence. It's as if the story is not finished. That's what the book of Chronicles is about. In the book of Chronicles, you guys know the first word of it? Of course. Because you're Hebrew Bible scholars. Adam. It starts with Adam. The book of Chronicles takes you through the story from Adam all the way to the hope of a return from exile. And the point of Chronicles is that Ezra and Nehemiah is not the ultimate return from exile. And we'll actually see that in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. So Ezra and Nehemiah is part of the fulfillment, but is not the fulfillment. That's how the book is working. So now we're in Ezra and Nehemiah. So verses one through four, they, they kind of function as this little key for us for what's going to be going on in the book. Uh, one is, uh, is a charge to build and to return. So they're let, let him go up to Jerusalem to rebuild, build. So the entire book is about this returning and this building. But it's what, like the reason why they're returning and they're rebuilding is not because Cyrus is an awesome king, although Cyrus is an awesome king. But why is Cyrus an awesome king? Because God had prophesied by the mouth of Jeremiah, and he's fulfilling his word. God's fulfilling his promises through the prophet. That's why Cyrus does this. So on one hand, you could look at um, the king of, of Persia, Cyrus, from just a historical and political aspect. So what he did is in 539 BC, he comes in and he just thwarts Babylon, takes them out. He, he basically comes into the king of Babylon's house. And he says, this is my house now. Like, that's how he wins. He says, get out. This is my house. And then he, he goes to sleep in the king's bed. Um, so kind of a beast. And then um, each king in this ancient time, they had their own way of winning favor or controlling the people. So Assyria, the way Assyria did it politically is they would conquer places and then they would take some of the people out and they would bring some people in. Think the Samaritans. So it'd be like if I took maybe two thirds of this room, two thirds of you out, and then I also brought in some, maybe some people from Japan who only speak Japanese, and I bring some people from Indonesia, and I, then I also bring some people from Paris and who, who don't speak English, and then I say, now you have to live together. What happens is it isolates you if you're not able to communicate to each other. And then your allegiance goes towards the person who you pay taxes to and the person who provides protection for you rather than having a social identity. So that was what Assyria did. What Babylon did was instead of mixing up the people who lived in the place, instead they just came in and they said, okay, who's the most fit and the smartest here? We're just going to take all of you and we're going to take you back to Babylon and we're going to make you warriors for our nation and we're going to make you... Uh, we're going to make you learn our own language and you, we're going to make you work in our kingdom. So then they left all the poor people and the people who aren't, weren't able to do things for themselves, but they took the, the social elites, like people like Daniel, people like Ezekiel, who was a priest. That's why the Babylonians take them. What Cyrus did is rather than having people all worship the same God and all speak the same language, what Cyrus did is he said, the way, what I'm going to do, I'm going to send everyone home and give them the opportunity to be back in their own land and to speak their own language and to worship their own gods as long as they continue to pay taxes. After exile, that's a pretty good deal. So that was the, the social political move that was being made there. So we could just say, you know, it was just a king making a social political move. Sure. But theologically, it's God fulfilling his word, and this is God accomplishing his purposes through pagan kings through his providential means. He's stirring up their spirit. So what we have in these two verses, <clears throat> uh, first is that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. Okay, so what was Jeremiah about? <laughs> That's like, what you, all of a sudden, you have to remember the entire book of Jeremiah, not just a verse in Jeremiah, but the whole message of Jeremiah. So if you're not really knowledgeable about Jeremiah, how do you think Ezra and Nehemiah is going to feel for you? I don't know, probably, probably not really know what's going on. But there are some key parts of Jeremiah. What were some highlight moments of Jeremiah that you can remember? Did 
They would be there for 70 years. Yeah. God would bring them back after 70 years. It won't be two years, but 70 years. Yeah, that was a highlight moment. Chapter 25, chapter 29 makes reference to that. Yeah. Uh, does this book kind of pivot aspect down in the direction? That is Isaiah and a little bit of like Ezekiel. But there is a moment in Jeremiah where there's like a pause and moment of comfort. But what was the moment of comfort? Remember chapters 30 through 33? A unique promise in the book of Jeremiah. Yeah, the new covenant promise. And specifically, what was the promise of the new covenant in Jeremiah? You remember? Yeah, new heart. So, <clears throat> here's the beginning of the book. One, one, through, is it five? No, four. The book of Jeremiah. God will bring you home after 70 years. Return. Rebuild. Uh, also a new heart. And what does Ezekiel add to that? New heart and a new spirit. Yeah. Um, in the book of Jeremiah, <clears throat> chapters 30 through 33, uh, when the people return, when they rebuild, because <clears throat> God is bringing them home, because he's establishing a new covenant with them. Uh, there's also this hope of a messianic age. There's going to be a Messiah. Messiah? And when the Messiah comes, what else happens? The nations. The nations come. Okay, so this is like the book of Jeremiah. Just like downloaded it all into our heads. But then there's another line. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Stirred up? Stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia? Well, oh, do I not have a note? Messed up. No. No. Oh, I do. Okay. All right. Um, in Jeremiah 51, 1 and 11, see, I will stir up the spirit of a destroyer against Babylon. The Lord has stirred up the king of the Medes, Medo-Persian Empire, because his purpose is to destroy Babylon, Isaiah 13, 17. See, I will stir up against them the Medes, Isaiah 41, 2 through 3. Who has stirred up one from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service? Isaiah 41, 25. I have stirred up one from the north and he comes, Isaiah 45, 13. I will stir up Cyrus. So um, what's happening here is, is not only are we downloading the entire book of Jeremiah into our, our initiating of this reading. Also the whole book of Isaiah. Like the, the whole prophetic um, package is supposed to now be in our minds as we begin to read this just from the first sentence. But if you miss it, you kind of miss the book, right? So this is why, like my first few times reading this book, I'm like, what the heck is this book about? Why is this in here? Because <laughs> I would miss things like this. So then we get the Edict of Cyrus. Um, and then we're just off to the races watching this fulfillment. And the way... Um, the story works is it's going to tell a new story by telling an old story. The way the book tells a new story is it tells an old story. So um, biblical authors are doing this all the time where they're using language from a past story to show you that this is a new story and a fulfillment of that old story. So we're just going to, we're going to kind of take um, an overview approach to these chapters. We're just going to kind of, um, swing through them. I'm just going to point things out. We'll slow down in some spots, but not really. And then we'll just have fun along the way. Yeah, Kathleen. Okay, so you read the beginning and you download Jeremiah and all the prophets. Mm -hmm. And you think, oh, it's the fulfillment. Yeah. And that's why it keeps ending badly. Like, oh, wait, this isn't. Right. Yep. Because otherwise we would think that all the prophets. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and there are key parts of that covenant promise that um, God's going to bring the people back. They're going to rebuild and, and in return, he's going to establish a Messiah who's going to be their king and their, their prince. And then the nations are going to, to flood in and to be blessed and they're experiencing the Abrahamic, um, co- the Abrahamic blessing. Uh, think about that then when you get to sections like chapters three and four, when peoples of the land are like, we want to help you rebuild. Or when they send away their foreign wives. And you're like, well, hold on a second. And we're going we're gonna to pause and look at the, those spots because it is kind of like a head scratcher mo- moment of why is this happening? Um, we're not told how to think about it. It's, I think it's purposely ambiguous, but each section ends anticlimactically to tell you this is part of it, but it's not the whole of it. So here's how it begins. The, the spirit of Cyrus is, is stirred up <clears throat> and he, he gives this edict. Everyone go back. Then rose up the heads of the father's house of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God stirred up to go and to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. So not only did God stir up the spirit of Cyrus, he also stirred up some of the people who were, were Israelites, were Judites living in Babylon. Not all of them, a lot stay, but some God did stir up to go and to rebuild. And all who were about, who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold and with goods, with beasts and with costly wares, besides all that was freely offered. So Nebuchadnezzar sends them back. And then again, in verse nine, we find out that here's the number of them. They're like, here's how rich they were. 30 basins of gold, a thousand basins of silver, 29 censers, 30 bowls of gold, 410 bowls of silver, a thousand other vessels. All the vessels of gold and of silver were 5,400. All these did Sheshbazar bring up. Then the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem. You guys remember any other stories where people leave a land and get a ton of gold and silver? Yeah, Egypt. Exactly. And this phrase right here at the end, when the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem, this little phrase, the people brought up, that's the key phrase that's used about God rescuing the people out of Egypt, that he brings them up out of the land. Let me just see. I think I put some notes down. Um, Exodus 31.1. The Lord said to Moses, depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to your offspring, I will give it. <clears throat> so the introduction of this story is like, this is a new exodus. It's a new exodus. Uh, here in this story, um, Cyrus is letting them go. You know, he's kind of like a better pharaoh. He lets them go. They, they give them all this gold, but all the language, it's, it's echoing the plundering of Egypt. It's as if God liberating his people by stirring up Cyrus is is God actually plundering the nations through his people? And they come out rich and God is bringing them up out of the land. So here it's echoing the Exodus. So this is a new Exodus, a release. Oh, here, before I spoil it. What was the Exodus event? How would you summarize briefly or shortly the Exodus event? What's taking place? Mm-hmm. And, you, and what is redeeming? Like, what is he redeeming them from? Slavery. Slavery. And what are the people in Babylon? Slaves. They are slaves. So God is, if it's a new exodus, he's releasing the slaves. It's another exodus moment where he's releasing the slaves. And that idea of slavery is going to be really important in this book. Because we're going to get to chapter 9, where Ezra prays during... Um, when all the, the the men have married foreign women. And then when we get to Nehemiah's prayer in, in Nehemiah t- chapter 9, and both in, of their praise, the prayers, they say, we're slaves. So there's this emphasis on being slaves in this book. But at first you're like, this is the end of our slavery. This is it. Now, these were the people of the, provident, uh, of the province who came up with the captive uh, out of the captivity of those exiled by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who carried captive to Babylonia. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Rel- Reliah, more, he's probably really reliable, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispar, Bigvi, Rehum, and Baana. How many? Yeah. 
Yep. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and what's going on here? Oh, yes. There's only eleven here, but in Nehemiah seven seven, it's the same list, and there's twelve listed. So scholars think that this is just a, um, a, the scribes passing it down just missed a name in this this chapter right here, because in seven seven there's twelve people. So the return, the way the return is highlighted, is with twelve um, people coming back. So it's like the twelve tribes are returning. Um, however. Zerubbabel, Jeshua, will they come back in the first wave? Nehemiah. Like, Nehemiah is like 100 years later, like way later. So the way the story is being told is they're telling you about key figures who returned, but they didn't all return at once or at the same time. It'd be like talking about um, um, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt, you know, key figures. But they're not all at the same time. But you get like what I'm doing. I'm talking about the establishment of something great. You know, you're like, oh, yeah, okay, I get what's going on there. And then you read a census. Any other stories that you remember where there's a census of people? Huh? Oh, but uh, a time that we actually read a census. Not in Exodus. Yeah, there is the one with David. Um, after the Exodus event, though, there's a book called Leviticus and a book called Numbers. And Numbers begins and ends with a census. And the census is telling you the people who can participate in war, um, but also the people who went out of Egypt who were brought up out from the Exodus event. So here are the people who are coming out of the, this new Exodus event and the people who are returning. And you find out there's people from families, there's Levites, there's priests, there's people who are temple servants who are coming back. There's people who are just singers. And, you know, you got to have the singers with you. Some of the heads of families, when they came to the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem, made free will offerings for the house of God to erect it on its site. This is um, another reference here to Exodus. The, the free will contribution. This is what they do uh, in the book of Exodus, Exodus 25 and Exodus 35 for the contribution of the tabernacle. So they return and they're just replaying their history as a people. When the seventh month came, seventh month? What's important about the seventh month in the Jewish faith or in your Bible? What happens in the seventh month? Leviticus 25. Feast of Booths. Oh, you cheater. You read ahead, didn't you? <laughs> yes, the Feast of Booth happens, but also two other feasts. The first of the seventh month is the Feast of Trumpets. And then 10 days into the seventh month is uh, the Day of Atonement. The day when sins are taken care of by the high priest. And then, um, ten, uh, let's see, what is it? So that's day 10. And then... Um, it's a few days after that. I think it's four days after that. And then for a full week, it's the Feast of Booths. So the seventh month for them is kind of like our um, our Thanksgiving to New Year's. We're just like holiday after holiday. Boom, boom, boom. You're just like celebrating and eating all the time. That is the seventh month. But the seventh month is when sins are atoned for. Sins are atoned for. Just like remember that. It's going to be important. So it's the seventh month, and children of Israel, they're all in town. And then arose Jeshua, the son of Je Jos Jos Josedach, you know, he's the high priest, and the fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel. So Zerubbabel is a, is a descendant of David, and Jeshua is a descendant of the priest. So you have the line of David and the line of Aaron, and here they are restoring the people. And they built the altar of God, of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So why rebuild the altar first? For sacrifices. So it's the place where sin is dealt with and where thanksgiving and worship is also made. And it's the seventh month. How do you participate in, in the festivities of the seventh month if there is no altar? So that is priority number one. They build an altar. I don't know if I have any cool notes here. Yep. Okay, um, 
they rebuild the altar. They set the altar in its place. Um, and fear was on them because of the peoples of the land. Get this little detail. They're just like afraid of, of the peoples of the land. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. And they kept the Feast of Booths. Feast of Booths for a week. They, they make these little um, personal tabernacles, these uh, Sukkot, these little tent, tent. And what they're doing is they're reenacting um, the story of the wilderness wanderings, of how God provided for them while in the wilderness when they were outside of the land. So they go outside of their home, build a little tent, and they're replaying the wilderness narratives. So think about it. The way the story is being told, this is a new exodus moment. Then you have a census. And then they're replaying the wilderness wanderings with the, the festivities of, of booths or tabernacles. Uh, and they're, they're giving these, these um, offerings and everything is going great. And then in verse uh, 6, from the first day of the seventh month, um, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So they gave money to the masons and carpenters and food, drink, and oil to the Sidonians and the Ty Tyrians. Tyrians? That sounds right. Tyrians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa, according to the grant they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Those are the places that they got the trees for the temple of Solomon. Except for when they did the temple of Solomon, they did it with slave labor. And now they're paying people. It's, like it's going to be like a better temple. Okay. One that's not built with slavery, but one that's built with actual money. Verse 8. Now, in the second year, after their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of jo Josedach, made a beginning together with the rest of their kinsmen, the priests and the Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. They appointed the Levites, 20 years old and upward, to supervise all the work, and they brought all the people in. They supervised the work with, uh, that God was doing for the house, along with Hinnadad, the Levite, and their sons and brothers. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, and the praise of the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when, the, when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of the house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. And the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. Okay, that's like part one of a two-part story. You have the altar and the temple foundation being laid. And why are people reacting like this? Why are some weeping and some rejoicing? Possibly. That's one possibility. Yeah, maybe it's just like, ah, this kind of sucks. This is so much smaller. Yeah. Does verse 13 mean the weeping is a lot louder? I think it's just like a, a mixed bag. So you're like, what's that sound? Are people crying? Are people celebrating? Yeah, maybe just disappointed. Maybe weeping for joy. Yeah, I guess we'll have to keep, just keep reading to find out. It's kind of ambiguous. Oops. Okay. Now, when the adversaries or the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do. And we have been sacrificing to him ever since the day of Eshardon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. It's a little hyperlink back to... 2 Kings chapter 17. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the father's house in Israel said to them, You have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God, but we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Okay, so we're introduced to them as enemies. Is this keying us into a reality of what they are in this moment or what they become?
they're not acting like enemies. Yeah, they're definitely not acting like enemies in the first place. And maybe, you know, maybe they want to like deceive them, but it doesn't seem like it, it just seems like a genuine request right here. Um, so what seems like would happen is the author is telling you um, from the perspective of the author, like, hey, the, the, our enemies, here's how they become enemies. This is the story. Like, this is their origin story for becoming the villains of the story. Um, that's one view. Another view is just like they fervently oppose it and they're trying to corrupt the plans. Those are two positions that you can take. Um, but right here they say, let, let us build with you. So it doesn't really sound like enemies. So in, in 2 Kings 17, the um, northern kingdom is taken into exile and some people are taken in. And then you have that mixed bag that creates Samaritans. And in, in that story, you find out, well, they bring all these people in and they don't know how to fear Yahweh. So then what uh, the Assyrians do is they grab some priests and they bring them in to teach the people how to fear Yahweh. Because remember, there was all that, those details about lions coming in and eating the people for not, <laughs> it's a really like weird text, but it's cool. Um, then the priests come in, they teach them and they feared Yahweh and worshiped other gods. You have this little detail that they feared Yahweh and worshiped other gods. Um, here in verse 32 to 33. They also feared the Lord and appointed from among themselves all sorts of people as priests of the high places who sacrificed for them in the shrines of the high places. So they feared the Lord, but also served their own gods after the manner of the nations from among whom they had been carried away. So here's my question about that text. Does that mean every individual person was doing this? Like, does that mean that Ben was worshiping Yahweh and Baal? And so was Ashley. And so was Mike. And so was Kathleen. Or does that mean that like some of them were worshiping Yahweh and some of them were worshiping Baal? So you have like Ben over here, he's worshiping Yahweh, but then Ashley is worshiping Baal. So then I can speak of the collective people and say they were fearing Yahweh and worshiping other gods. See how both of those statements can be true. So is it a universal statement that each individual person was um, mixing their worship, or is it a, a statement of the corporate collection of people that some were worshiping Yahweh and some were worshiping other gods? The text is ambiguous. We don't know. But here are some people who come and they say, hey, we've been worshiping Yahweh here uh, since the king of Assyria brought us here, this, we, and we want to be a part of this. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua, they're like, no, thank you. Um, so here is a question. What about Zechariah chapter 2, 10 through 13? Zechariah is a contemporary prophet. He says, sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people. And I will dwell in your midst and you shall know the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Did you catch it? So Zechariah, the hope in Zechariah, a contemporary prophet, is that many nations so join themselves to the Lord in that day. And here is a story about nations coming and saying, we want to join you. And then the people say, no. <laughs> How are you supposed to feel about that? Also, um, Zechariah chapter 8, verses 20 through 23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, peoples, peoples, that's what we're referring to the nations, peoples shall yet come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I myself am going. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew saying, let us go with you for we have heard that God is with you. The nation's coming and joining the people. So how are we supposed to feel about this story? Knowing the other prophetic books. Yeah. Is this another writer? This isn't that. Maybe. Or are those responses to are the prophecies written after this story and their responses to what was going on and it's the prophets saying, you shouldn't have done that. Maybe. They do act nasty after that. But were they enemies from the beginning? 
or did they become enemies? Yeah, Mike. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we'll talk about that. Yeah. Mike? I think from the perspective of the protocol, it hasn't been built. Okay. So they expect that to work in the present day. Why is that? Okay. So maybe for Zerubel, it's not like a no forever, it's just a no, not yet. But, yeah. Like you can join us in a little bit, but right now we need to build. But it, what I'm trying to say is separating Riot's profit from the protocol. That's mm -hmm. That's still, that's present. Not among yeah. people, not going to Okay. Yeah. Okay, so kind of hard text. You're going to say something, Sandy? Well, I just wondered if he would. Uh, Zerubbabel builds it. He does build the temple. Yeah, but he was the first one. And he, he builds it. So the temple gets built in Zerubbabel's time. So 539 is when Cyrus becomes king and the Edict of Cyrus is released. Um, 538, they're back in Jerusalem. They begin to rebuild the altar and the temple. And then they get discouraged because of the adversaries or the enemies. And then they stop. And then Haggai... Right, college students? Haggai shows up and he says, start building the temple again. And that's in 520. So in 520 BC, they start to rebuild the temple. And it takes them six years from that point to finish it. And that's all in Zerubbabel's time. Um, so they finished the temple in roughly 515. Maybe it's 514. Maybe it's 516. And what year was the final, what was the destruction of the temple? And the final exile from Jerusalem? 586. And what's 586 take away 70? Hmm. About 70 years. Crazy. <laughs> it's like it's prophetic. Like God knows. Okay. So this text right here, maybe it's a missed opportunity. Maybe they're doing what's right. It's ambiguous. We don't know. They're, they're trying to be faithful. They're trying to be faithful to what God's called them to do. Um, but maybe this was a missed opportunity because we also have other biblical texts and we, we think through all of them together. So they say, no, you can't join us. Then the people of the land, notice this plural, not people of the lands. When it's people of the lands, it usually is referring to multiple people groups. But people of the land throughout the Old Testament um, tends to refer to the people of Jerusalem, to Israelites specifically. And if you remember, both in the Assyrian exile and with the, the exile of Judah, a lot of people got left behind. Remember, Jeremiah gets left behind and a ton of other Israelites. So people did stay in the land. When it says the people of the land, that might just mean Israelite people who were never exiled. That's usually what that phrase means in the rest of the Bible. So maybe also here. So perhaps the Israelites who were never exiled, they discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build. And they bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. All the days of King Cyrus, the Persian, uh, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Okay, here's where this book gets complex. So what you're going to read now is all this, um, all these letter interactions of, of resistance and opposition. But it's not happening chronologically in the story. So Cyrus to Darius, 
And then verse six, and in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. Verse seven, and in the days of Artaxerxes, Bishlam and Mithridah and Tabail and the rest of their associates wrote to Artaxerxes the king, the Persian, and they write this letter in Aramaic. And they write about how, oh, these people are going to stop paying taxes. And if you keep letting them rebuild, everything's going to go to waste. So the story is right here to show you that they're getting opposition, but the story is not in chronological order. Let me just show you. <clears throat> so the letter that you're about to read is 70 years later, at least, from the story that's taking place. Cyrus was king from 559 to 529 BC. Then you have Darius king, and he is from, oh, I'm, I'm excuse, excuse me, I skipped Cambyses II, 530 to 522. Then Darius from 522 to 486. Then Xerxes, that's his Greek name, also known as Ahasuerus. He's the king who um, is king in the story of Esther. 486 to 465. Then Artaxerxes, 464 to 424. Artaxerxes is the one who sends Ezra and who sends Nehemiah. So the letter that's being written that you're about to read about is a letter written to Artaxerxes. And then you have Darius the second. But Artaxerxes is like, this is all taking place 70 years after the story that we just read about them beginning to rebuild the temple. So the letter is not about the temple. And then when you read the letter, you can see the writing to uh, Artaxerxes is the king. And they say, they are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are finishing the walls. What's the letter about? The wall. The walls. It's about Nehemiah's. What Nehemiah is up to. They're like, man, if you let them finish those walls that Nehemiah is building, once they finish the walls, then they're going to rebel because they're going to be a fortified city again. Then they'll be able to fight against you. They'll stop paying taxes. They'll establish a king. Don't let them build that wall. So it's completely out of chronological order. But what the author is doing right here is he goes from the contemporary Cyrus. Cyrus, he skips the king, goes to Darius, then Ahasuerus, then Artaxerxes. And what he's doing is he's saying, since our return, even until our day today, because remember, Artaxerxes is the one who sends back Ezra and Nehemiah, and it's probably them writing this book, or at least a lot of it. They're saying, since we've returned, we have been facing opposition in this building process. Usually, when people, followers of God, face opposition, their first interpretation is, this must not be God's will for my life. Maybe God doesn't want me to do this. And they face opposition for like 70 years, and it doesn't stop them. A little bit of opposition does not mean that it's not God's will. Sometimes it is just hard to accomplish, it, accomplish the purposes that God set before you. And you have to push past a few people. Um, so it's a, it's a theological device here, a literary device, not a, a historical chronological device. It's not just trying to tell you what transpired during the rebuilding of the temple. They're trying to tell you that the entire time there has always been opposition. Then we get to chapter 5. Now the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Ido, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel who was over them. So that's like your little flashing light. Hey, go read Haggai and Zechariah if you haven't already, which we will, <laughs> even though we haven't. Their books are important. Um, Haggai, it, very short, it's just three chapters, but he, he looks at the people and he says, wow, you live in really nice paneled houses. I mean, you have you have a porch, you have a swing, you have two sinks, you have a mud room, and yet the house of God is sitting in ruins and you haven't taken time to rebuild that. So you need to get to work. So then in 520, they begin to rebuild. Um, Zechariah is talking about the reestablishment of a kingly line and a priestly line. And it's a, a beautiful prophetic book. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of um, Josadak arose and began to rebuild the house of God that is in Jerusalem and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. So that in just two verses, it's like, hey, go read their books. And then you come back and they're like, their books were successful. They, their prophetic ministry was a success. And then you find out about another letter to King Darius. And just a reminder, Darius is in 522 to 486. So 520 is when the temple project uh, re-engages. And then it takes about six years for them to finish it. So it's during the reign of Darius 
that they finish the temple. Uh, no, once they like restart, they, they see it to completion. Yeah, they do great. Um, and then we get to chapter six and we have another, another decree and the temple is finished and it's dedicated. And when it's dedicated, uh, all the elders of the Jews, they, they built and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai, the prophet and Zechariah, the son of Ido. And they finished their building by the decree of God of Israel and by the decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. He's a future king. Interesting that he gets thrown into the, this mix, but he's the one who sends back Ezra and Nehemiah. So he's a key part of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar on, in the sixth year of the reign of Darius. So that's why we know if he starts reigning in 522, the temple was finished in 516. Right? Good math. And the people of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the returns from exiles celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. So again, there's a celebration of joy. And they offered all their dedications of bulls and rams and lambs as sin offerings and all Israel, 12 male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. How many tribes returned? Not 12. It was Judah, Benjamin, and some of the Levites. But they're celebrating as if all of Israel has been returned and restored to the land. And they set the priests and their divisions and the Levites and their divisions for the service of God at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. So it's done. They commemorate it. And what usually happens in the Bible when they finish the tabernacle or the temple? God shows up and the glory cloud descends and fills the tabernacle or fills the temple and the people can't go into it. And there's no mention here. They're like, uh-oh, that's not good. And then they celebrate Passover. They have a Passover meal. On the 14th day of the first month, the returned exiles kept the Passover and they, they slaughter a lamb and they have, have the bread and they separate themselves. And this is an interesting detail in verse 21. It was eaten by the people of Israel who had returned from exile and also by everyone who had joined them and separate himself from the uncleanness of the people of the land to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. See what's going on there? So it's Israelites and non-Israelites in this Passover celebration. It's the non-Israelites who have separated themselves from worshiping other gods and have joined Israel in the worshiping of Yahweh. So this is like, okay, that past story in chapter three, did Zerubbabel actually say no, or was he strategically only saying no to the polytheists? Say, no, 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 if you'll give your allegiance to Yahweh, of course you can join us. It's just another amb amb ambiguity in the story. But the way the story is being told, we're supposed to see these anticlimactic resolutions. But it does seem that they did let non-Israelites join them, those who would separate from worshiping false gods. They kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with joy, for the Lord had made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them, so that he aided them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. So that is our first story of the temple. They return, they start to rebuild, they face some adversity. Things are going good, things are going all right. And then they rebuild and there's no return of, of Yahweh's glory. You're like, ah, oh, all right, well, that's the story. And you go to the next one. <laughs> Um, yes, and the Lord had made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them so that he, yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, I didn't even see that. King of okay. Yeah. In a way, you changed. Yeah. Very interesting. I want to think about that more. Thanks for pointing that out. I'm just going to highlight it. Very interesting. Okay, next story. Now we jump forward a ton in time. So all those stories were happening between 538 and 516-ish, the commemoration of the temple. So now we're zooming forward in time to 458. So we're jumping forward about 60 years, and we're in the reign of Artaxerxes, and we're going to hear about Ezra. 
Um, this, this is riveting reading right here, right? You guys catch all this? So, so cool. Okay. So just like the Zerubbabel story is mapped onto an older story to tell you that it's a new story, the, the Exodus, this is a new Exodus. This story does the same thing with how it even introduces you to Ezra. So Ezra is a priest. He's from the line of Aaron. And, and Ezra is going to be presented as a new Moses in this story. And this is structured by, by giving you his lineage. See, it's tracing back to Aaron. But there, this, there was a lot of people left out of this genealogy. This is like hundreds of years after Aaron. But if you notice, uh, let's just count, yeah? You count, I read. Sariah, Azariah, Hilkiah, Shalom, Zadok, Ahitu, Amariah. Okay? Then there's Azariah. Let's just, uh, let's just start counting over again. Moriah, Zariah, Uzi, Buki, good son name, Abishua, Phineas, Eleazar. Okay. So you have Ezra and Aaron. And then you have Azariah. And Azariah is the first priest who was priest in the Temple of Solomon. So he's right in the middle. And in between Ezra and Azariah, you have seven priests. And in between Azariah and Aaron, you have seven priests. And Azariah's name is spelled with the same letters as Ezra. Both come from the Hebrew word for help. Um, Azariah uh, means Yahweh is my help. And Ezra means like helper or help. So Ezra is being presented in the story, not just as a new Moses, but also as a new Aaron. He, he is the new Aaron, the new high priest. And just in this cool literary structure, they're showing you him as a fulfillment of this hope. So here comes Ezra to fulfill our hope of a priest from the line of Aaron. This Ezra went up from Babylon. Why would it say that this Ezra went up? Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem. And here comes Ezra. If, and if he's going up, then who's with him? Yahweh. Yahweh's with him. Uh, he's, he's a really good scribe. And he's skilled in the law of Moses, the, Lord, uh, the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. Uh, and Artaxerxes, the king, with some people, he, he sends him, and he's going to send him back to the land. Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylonia. And on the first day of the first month, he came to Jerusalem, uh, of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem. So, even our little introduction, our Xerxes calls him, he's going to send him back. He's going to establish him as basically a governor to establish some um, regional rules governed by the priestly system. And our Xerxes is going to send him. And what we hear is that, uh, well, first we hear what month he arrives in, but then we hear about what month he left in. Verse 9, for on the first day of the first month, first month he began to go up. Do you think he chose the day that he went? I do. What's the first day of the first month? New Year's. <laughs> In the Passover. Yeah, Exodus 12. Um, the first day of the first month, Passover celebrates when the people of Israel went up from the land of Egypt. So he, the way he structures his return is he intentionally is reenacting the Exodus event. Like he waits until the first day of the first month to go up from the land of Babylonia to make his return. Like that is very intentional. He is trying to replay his people's history. It'd be like if we wanted to establish some sort of independence in this nation and we plan to do it on July 4th. Like it's so intentional and purposeful. It's saying that we're not only replaying our history, but we're, we're bringing about a new history for the people. Ezra is a priest. Ezra is a, a scribe. And then he also gets a ton of silver and gold. A ton of silver and gold. He plunders the Babylonians in a sense, but now it's the Medo-Persians. He takes all the gold and he makes his trek up out of the land. So it's just, again, replaying the Exodus story. Um, 
Then we get to chapter eight and you get a list of the people who, who returned with, with Ezra. Um, so you have here, let's see, different colors. Chapter two, chapter eight, and then chapter seven. You're going to have like these lists. This one in chapter two and chapter seven are basically identical. But they're lists of returns. These are the heads of their father's house. And this is the genealogy of those who went up with me from Babylonia. In the reign of Artaxerxes, the king of the sons of Phineas, Gershom, of the sons of Ithamar, Daniel, of the sons of David, Hattush, of the sons of Shechaniah. So then he keeps going. So first he gives um, some priests, two priests, and someone from the line of David. So like very important figures. And you have three See that? There's Gershom from Phineas's line. There's Daniel from Ithamar's line. And then there's Hattush from David's line, a descendant of David. Three key, um, basically royal figures of the house of Judah. And then I've highlighted it for us to be able to see, because it's like, listen, just, it's so hard. Of the sons of Shechaniah, who was of the sons of Parash, Zechariah. <laughs> with whom were registered 150 men. It's so confusing how they word it, but I've highlighted the people, the, these heads of families. So let's just count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Three and 12. Three patriarchs, 12 tribes. Three major prophets, 12 minor prophets. Three royal family members and 12 regular family members. So it's just a return of the people of Israel. Like the way he's even structured the return. He's picked 12 notable families and three, uh, the two of being priests and one being the line of David. And he takes those families and they're making this return with them. It's so smart. So it's a new Exodus event, the way this is structured. So then he gets Levites because he's like, you can't forget the Levites to be carrying all, all the goods. And they proclaim a fast and they're praying and they're seeking God to, for a safe journey or literally in Hebrew, a, uh, a straight way, straight way. Anyone remember Isaiah 40 verse three, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert, a highway for our God It is the same phrase. So he's hoping for the prophetic hope of a straight way for the return of the Lord. Then he, um, for the journey, he sets apart 12 of the leading priests. Come on, 12 priests. We came to Jerusalem and there we remained for three days. Why remain three days when you get there? What a strange detail. Well, remember when Joshua and the people of Israel, they went through the Jordan River and they got into the promised land and then they chill for three days. So not only is he like this new Moses figure, he's this new Joshua figure bringing the people in. And then it's like, this is awesome. Like everybody's returning. They're going to establish Torah. He's going to teach them. And then we have these stories about <coughs> intermarriage and divorce. So let's talk about them. Oh, we're running out of time so fast. Okay. After these things had been done, the officials approached me and said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations. So my first question is, are, have they not separated from the people or have they not separated from the abominations or both? Like, have they taken the people of the lands and the, the worship of other gods or have they just taken the people of other gods and they're implying that that is a taking of their abominations? And then you get this list of the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. Like the Egyptians are just thrown in there. These are people groups that don't exist anymore. Originally the land, the people of the land of Canaan, the seven tribes, but then they throw the Egyptians in there. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race or the, ho the holy seed has mixed itself with the peoples of 
the lands. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and chief men has been foremost. So it's the leaders who are, are doing this. There's a lot of things going on right here. Uh, first, these peoples do not exist anymore. These were the Canaanites, the, the people of Israel in Deuteronomy 7 verses 1 through 3. They were told not to marry with the people of, of Canaan going into the land because it would make them turn their hearts away and they would worship other gods. That's why they're told not to do that. Um, the Egyptians are not in that list. Um, but what they are assuming here is they're actually applying those Old Testament laws and their assumption is they've, ta- they've actually changed this, this verse right here. There is verses that they're supposed to be a holy people. And now they're interpreting that to be a holy people as you're supposed to be a holy race or a holy seed or a holy ethnicity. So they've reinterpreted um, a passage from Deuteronomy um, that they're supposed to be a holy ethnicity rather than a holy people who are set apart and worship God faithfully. And what they've done is they've taken these, these commands about ancient Canaanites and they have applied it to all people who are not Israelites anymore. But is the Torah opposed to Israelites marrying non-Israelites? No. There's uh, Ruth. There's Rahab. There's um, Moses' wife. What's her name? Um, Moses and... You know, Moses' wife. Yeah. Mrs. Moses. Mrs. Moses. <laughs> yeah. Um, Abraham. Abraham's wife. Isaac's wife. Like, they're not Israelites. None of them are Israelites. So the Torah is not opposed to marrying non-Israelites. There was a specific law about not marrying the Canaanites, a people that do not exist anymore. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to faithfully discern how does the Old Testament apply to me today? How do those old Torah commands speak to me in my current position? Because they really do believe that it does speak. And they're trying to be faithful in their interpretation of that. Um, so he hears this and he's heartbroken. He, he, just, he starts lamenting and he says in verse 9, For we are slaves. Hold on, they've gone home. He says we're slaves. Yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia. So they decide that what they're going to do is, <clears throat> actually, let's read this, verse 2 of chapter 10. Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, the sons of the sons of Elam, addressed Ezra. We have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land, but even now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. Therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children, according to the counsel of my Lord. Who's my Lord right here? Ezra, yeah. And of those who tremble at the commandments of our God and let it be done according to the law. Whose idea is the mass divorce? Shechaniah's. It's Shechaniah's idea. One of the leaders. Um, but then all the people say like, yeah, that's definitely what we should do. Um, so it's a corporate agreement, but Shechaniah's idea, is this God commanding them to do this? No, it's just them trying to be faithful people and being faithful to the hope that they have in God's covenant promises with the word of God that they have. Do they get it right? Do they get it wrong? I don't know. I think we're just like left to think, well, maybe they did get it right in their time, in their specific context, in their specific time, in their specific location, they did get it right. Or we scratch our head and say, maybe they got it wrong in this instance, because there's that book, um, Malachi, and Malachi talks about divorce. And one way to interpret the, the divorce section of Malachi is one thing, it was this the position that Brett took uh, last week, is that Malachi is rebuking them because they divorced their Israelite wives and then married foreign wives. So they put off their, their Israelite wives, their Israelite family to marry these foreign wives. So that's one way to take that. Or the other way to take it is that um, first they intermarry, which God was like, why are you doing this? And then they divorce them in this text. And God's like, and then you even divorce them. And I hate them. So those are two different ways to take this when we read the book of Malachi. But it's just one of those texts where we're like, well, maybe they got it right and they nailed it. Maybe they got it wrong and we're not really told. But that's how the story goes. And it concludes with uh, them sending them all the married foreign women away. uh, And even those with children. The end. Okay. 
Book of Ezra. I'm going to Nehemiah. How you guys doing? It's good stuff. Okay. Is this the fulfillment? Well, it's part of it. Part of the fulfillment. Not the fulfillment, though. The, the book of Nehemiah, um, Nehemiah's structure goes similar with the walls. He, he faces opposition seven times. There's seven little passages where, um, what are their names? Remember? Stan, Sanballat and uh, Tobiah. Yeah, Tobiah, which means Yahweh is my good. Um, but they give opposition and he, he rebuilds the wall and things are going, th- seem to be going really well. I want to jump into chapter nine. Chapter nine of Nehemiah is awesome. <clears throat> it's one giant like sermon prayer and it recounts the entire history of Israel. And I'm just going to zoom in on one section because I think it's, it's super important for understanding Jesus and understanding our biblical theology. So, so through this prayer, he, he's constantly using scripture from the past. Like you are the Lord, you alone. Um, that's from Deuteronomy chapter six. Uh, he recounts the wilderness wanderings and then the judges period. And the, the, um, he talks about how God kept sending them, <coughs> the people prophets to call them back into faithfulness. But there's this key detail down here, starting in verse 36. Behold, we are slaves this day day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts behold we are slaves it's an echo of this entire book and its rich yield goes to the king whom you have set set over us because of our sins this whole book from start to finish it's showing you that this is a new exodus but this is not the ultimate exodus so what was the Exodus event about? It was God redeeming people from what? Slavery. Good. So they were slaves. Or they were taken into Babylon, but then they're brought back, but they're still under foreign occupation. The Medo-Persians are foreign occupiers of Judah. And then once the Medo-Persians are overcome by the Greeks, it's the Greeks, and then it's the Romans. And even in Jesus' day, the Romans are, are foreign occupiers of Judah. So they're always under foreign occupation up until the days of Jesus. So like they are, even though they're in their home, they're slaves in their home. But then you have this detail in verse 37. And I think this is, this is a key for our biblical theology. It's rich yield goes to the Kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. Why are the people slaves? Because of sin. So here's what this is, is doing. I'm going to, we'll do this quick but it'll be worth it. Okay. So, wow, that looks cool. We're just going to keep it. So month one, one month, you have Passover. And Passover is about slavery. And then month seven, there's 14 months in the Jewish calendar. Month seven, you have the Day of Atonement. Which is about sin. There is the scapegoat. The priest um, confesses the sins of the people onto the scapegoat. And the scapegoat leaves the people and walks out into the wilderness. It's a visible picture of the sin being removed from the people, taken away from the people. And then they have the goat that they sacrifice. It's the blameless one. And it represents the people before God, a blameless representation before God. Rather than being um, represented by your sin, you're represented by a blameless substitute. Passover is not about sin in your Bible. No, it's about slavery. It's about the liberation of slavery. The Passover lamb is not about God atoning for sins in the story. The atonement story in month seven, Leviticus chapter 16, is about sin. So, yeah, uh, we celebrated it. We just call it Easter. Yeah, it was the, uh, it was that Easter for us. So what's happening is throughout the biblical narrative, these are on a trajectory course. Come on, correct that. 
where these are going to meet. And where do you think they're going to meet at? The cross, exactly. And what's happening in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah in our biblical theology is there's this, there's this prophetic hope as you're going through the Bible. Man, you know what we really need? We need a new Passover. We need a new Exodus event because we're slaves. We need God to once again redeem us from the hands of oppression and slavery and set the captive free. You know, like the whole book of Isaiah. But then there's also stuff like Isaiah 53. You know what we really need? We need something better than a goat, better than a lamb to atone for our sins. We need a righteous sufferer, sufferer to stand in our place and to be crushed for our iniquity. Someone to stand in our place for our sin and to make us righteous. So these are two unique hopes from two pivotal moments in the Bible. And what's happening is throughout the biblical narrative, they're getting closer and closer. And we're sitting in Ezra and Nehemiah, which is like right here at this moment. And Ezra, Nehemiah, Ezra is giving this sermon and he's, he's seeing the point. He said, man, we're still slaves. And we're slaves because of our sin. What we need is we need God to deal both with our slavery and with our sin. And that is the ultimate hope of Jesus. So when you get to the gospels, everything that Jesus does takes place on the week of Passover. He is crucified uh, the night of preparation for Passover, but all the language about what Jesus is doing is taken from the Day of Atonement. So it's this merger of these two events. I think I have a list of, of scriptures. So um, Matthew 26, 2. You know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. So he's going to die on the Passover. Matthew 26, 19. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. They actually enjoy a Passover meal together because that's when it's taking place. Luke 22, 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And that's the day that he's going to be sacrificed. You have John 19, 14. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, behold your king. So Jesus is being crucified on the Passover. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Paul calls Christ our Passover lamb. Cleanse out the old leaven and you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed, which means that you have been liberated from your slavery. You are free. But he is not just the Passover lamb. He's also the scapegoat and the sin offering. Matthew 1, 21. She shall bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. John 1, 29. This one merges it. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of of the world. That is day of atonement theology, not Passover theology. That's atonement theology. Luke 24, 46 through 47, he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead, and that the repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Forgiveness of sins is a day of atonement event. Acts 5, 31, God exalted him at his right hand as a leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. That is atonement language. Acts 10, 43, to him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's atonement language. 1 John 2, 2. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That is day of atonement language. Romans 6, 17 and 18. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. A new Passover and a new day 
of atonement. Galatians 6, 7, the last one we'll look at. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one so... I don't know. That one's totally not right. But the point is, these are two different days. So, so when you hear someone say Passover is about being set free from, from the slavery of sin. No, it's not. Not Passover in Exodus 12. Passover now, yes. Passover now, yes. We've been set free from our slavery to sin and death. In the Bible, though, these are biblical theological trajectories that meet with Christ on the cross. And that is why both Passover and atonement is so good for us. Let me pray, and then let's celebrate that. We're going to celebrate after service um, with baptisms, which are a picture of this very thing, being set free from slavery and being set free from sin and death. Father, thank you for this morning, and thank you for the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. God, thank you for showing us how you are, you are faithful and at work, uh, even in the slow process of the return. But God, you are faithful to your promises. And even though Ezra and Nehemiah is not the ultimate fulfillment, God, it is part of the fulfillment. And we see your faithfulness in these stories to bring about a new exodus, to bring about a new day of atonement. Because God, without Christ, we are slaves because of our sin. And God, you have made a way for us to be set free and be liberated. God, you have set free the captives and you have made a way for us to have eternal life. So we love you for that. And we're thankful for that. We pray all of this this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.